नमस्कार स्वामी जी आई एम सो ऑनर्ड एंड सो हैप्पी एंड ब्लेस दैट स्वामी जी इज हियर ही इज ऑलवेज बीन देयर फॉर मी नॉट ओनली पब्लिकली इन वेज दैट यू नो बट मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली आल्सो इन मेनी प्राइवेट वेज दैट यू डोंट नो ओके मेनी मेनी सटल बिहाइंड द सीन थिंग्स स्वामी जी हैज डन फॉर मी फॉर माय कॉज एंड आई एम वेरी ग्रेटफुल टू हिम बिकॉज सो मेनी थिंग्स हैपन because of the grace of our acharyas and our swamis and i'm always very grateful to them now uh, last night i spent the whole night editing one video which was my uh, talk at sanskrit bharati so i found that uh, the uh, high definition file was not uh, i was not able to edit in my in the software i use so i spent bunch of time getting some help from somebody in bombay and all they sent me the the conversion software i managed to do that then i had to load it which took another 3 hours onto the software then i had to get up very early in the morning do the editing then save it and then it end up as a 3 gb file and i did not know how to upload it just 2 minutes before i came here i managed to upload it to youtube so that's the first youtube so i have uh, really i have 24 hour job and people don't understand this that how much is going on behind the scenes they think i just write this quickly and just give a talk but i have to do all kind of things so after all that is done i'm so tired i look up my morning email and you will see why 90% of the well meaning emails i have to throw away first one says please give me the email id of shri rajiv malhotra they sent it to our Uh, web, the general website to Rajiv Malhotra so that I can give him advice on how to do this job. So I sent it back saying, "We do not. I'm sorry. I have enough gurus to teaching me advice. I have enough my hands full. What we need is help to do it. We are not looking for suggestions. A lot of the Kshatriyas feel that Kshatriyata means you sit in the VIP stand with binoculars, you're watching the game, making judgments. Say, 'Ha, very good shot. Ha, he should have run it like that. That is not Kshatriyata.'" that is these this uh, long distance i call it uh, mouse click clicking activism click mouse click click send it here there okay oh, yeah, i'm done today i go eat my pakoras and have chai and done chatya work today sir like that that's not what it is and it is actually a burden on me to deal with such people because if you ignore them they get angry if you write back a little message saying not looking for suggestions looking for action no shortage of ideas shortage of resources then they say oh you know then they don't like it and if you go back and forth enough times and they get angry at you go public and they start shouting they also turn into enemies so there is a lot of uh, ego issue that the kshatriya has to control to be a kshatriya there is a difference between the intellectual kshatriya and the emotional kshatriya the emotional kshatriya is somebody who is emotionally out of control passionate Uh, he'll be bombastic. He's not done the purva paksha because that requires a lot of hard work. He's done. He's full of opinions, putting out uttar paksh without purva paksh. Lot of I'll tell you, sir, but I don't have no time to read what you've written. That kind of thing. They have neither read me nor read the other side, but they are full of opinions. So this over opinionated, under informed, over opinionated but under informed person. with lot of emotional you know gusto lot of passion bombastic and all that this is not intellectual kshatriya in fact such people become also nuisance because they're doing rowdy things which make us look bad and so one of the questions somebody asked was in one of these sessions in bangalore why don't we call the opponents rakshasas because of their character you see that's the easy way out if you don't want to study his works because it's thousands of pages you can just dismiss his character and don't have to do any work but then why did i, I that means for 25 years i wasted my time because i could have just given them bad names and uh, done with it so, so this is the differentiation the of the type of work i'm asking people to do i'm trying to do myself from 99% of the people who are out there as hindu intellectuals 
because it's full of blame, it's full of anger, it's recycling the same knowledge, what one guy wrote, somebody else keep writing again and again. But pioneering new battlefields you have to find, you have to open new battlefronts. So my goal is each time I write a book, I want to write a book on a new battlefront. Something that is we don't know about, our people don't know about. Because it requires a lot of hard work of Puru Paksh and Uttar Paksh to open up a new battlefront. So this is my fifth book and five different battlefronts. And I have 15 more in the pipeline that I am trying my best to get out. Each one different and distinct. And the biggest uh, uh, insult to me is somebody who looks at book 5 and start commenting as if it is the same as 3, 4 or 1 book. You know. So I have to constantly tell them what the book is not about. Because they are not good at reading so they think it must be he's telling the same thing over and over again. Which is not what it is. It is kind of bringing down the value of what I am doing. Because I am not repeating the same points. It is a new, this is a new field. New scholars I am critiquing, new works I am right, looking at, uh, new arguments I am giving which I have not done before. Lot of commonality but huge amount of difference in every book. So, uh, a major part of becoming an intellectual Kshatriya is Tapasya. There is no way to shortcut that. If you shortcut that, you are not going to get ahead, you have, you may get ahead a little bit, then your ego will just want to show off and be in the limelight. And that is not what a good Kshatriya should be. Good Kshatriya should be based on Tapasya. And Tapasya is something you cannot uh, fast forward, you cannot, uh, there is no express Tapasya, you know. You know in California, they are launching a new soft drink called Somaras. Somaras. A, an Indian fellow who is a yoga teacher who went to US, invited by a lot of these white yoga centers, has a very exotic, authentic Indian, good mascot, good uh, showcase for them. Uh, and I was giving a talk on how yoga is being uh, misappropriated and a lot of people are taking over our knowledge and assets and uh, digesting them. And he came to me later on, introduced himself and said, sir, I am very much in agreement with you. I also watch it all the time and I am resisting it and I am not going to let it happen. I said, make sure as yoga teacher and expert on dharma that these yoga, American yoga centers are calling you, make sure you do not get appropriated because a lot of pe other people have gotten appropriated and they sell out. So he says, no, 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 I come from this lineage, that lineage, my parents, grandparents, whatever, I will never sell out, very sure. So, a few months later, he comes back on another trip to US, calls me again. So I invite him to my house and we have a nice conversation. Now he has moved up the ladder, up the uh, importance. Now he is getting big invites in America. So he is the one who tells me, sir, I am very proud to tell you, I am being hired to launch Somras. So I say, what is this Somras? So he goes me this video of uh, in California, somewhere in Hollywood big auditorium and they are launching Somras, some new venture. And the launch video, this American guy goes and he says that for thousands of years, the ancient rishis had to do all this tapasya to get enlightened and we bring it for five dollars in the can, you can have Somras. <laughs> and this man very proudly is the face endorsing it because it is authentic. So, this is how our people are also deluded. Our people are also deluded. He is thinking he is doing a favor for us, actually selling out. So, this is the uh, age of instant bypass the tapasya in a can or whatever. Knowledge in 140 characters, you can tweet. They ask me question on Twitter and they think that in 140 character I can answer what they are asking. Some very complicated thing they ask, they say, sir, please tell me this, 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 as if I am supposed to quickly type back some 140 character answer. The lack of time, short attention span, these are serious problems. So one of the things if you are a meditator, I mean you cannot be any of, in anything I am involved in unless you are a serious meditator. Because if you are a meditator, you have adhyatmic experience, you have a different sense of time, you appreciate silence, you have the joy of silence, you become a very creative person. 
you are rooted at a level where nothing will shake you. If they fight you, accuse you, blame you, okay. That's only at one level, but at a deep level, you're still very strong because of the adhyatmic clarity you have. So you must have tapasya, you must have meditation, you must have grace of guru, you must have these things in you. You must have shraddha. So you, intellectual kshatriya is not outward, showing off, bombastic, going make some speech, catch a few one-liners in a seminar and then go start putting out blogs. A lot of people doing that. So I, I, uh, uh, I have three components. In, people ask me, how have you learnt? And how have you become a Kshatriya? There's a lot of factors in one's own life, like how I was raised, my influence of my parents and all of these things. But I would say I, there are three important things I want to talk about. One is this whole sadhana. The sadhana, the tapasya, the inner process to prepare yourself. When I, start, when I left my work around 25 or so years ago, my guru said, you first have a lot of work to do on your own. Don't go around talking. Actually, it was many, many years later. I had been quietly doing a lot of work when I got guru's permission that you now go talk. And why, what happened, what was the occasion when I was asked to do the talking, there's another story I can tell you. But I was suddenly surprised one day to be told, okay, now you go talk. Because I, I, I would had to, been told that you know you have a lot of inside you have to bake and cook and uh, this thing has to incubate. You see the tapas has to happen. So this is one component, the inner process, and it never stops. I have to keep doing it all my life, trying to get better. I slip, I have to recover. Second part is serious intellectual study of texts. I have a library of few thousand books until my eyes started you know giving me problems a, year, a couple of years ago I used to be furious reader all the time so I read most of those taken notes had hired some people to type notes here and there that I've taken and these texts are not only texts from our tradition and commentaries but also texts of western thought I'm extremely well read in western philosophy western history uh, you know both their religious side, then their enlightenment movement, then the post enlightenment movement. I am read in science because I am trained as a scientist. So I have done that part and I have also done a lot of our stuff which is Vedanta and Shaivism and a lot of Sri Aurobindo and a lot of Buddhism. I have studied those kind of things quite uh, in many, from many voices. So the study along with the Adhyatmic practice keep working together. The more adhyatmic experience you have, the greater the clarity with which you can study the text. You go back to, every time I go back to Gita, it means more to me. And I every six months read the Gita again. Because it, I discover new things, new ways of looking. It's like many levels. So I, as I mature and my clarity gets better, I get new meanings into this. And conversely, the more I have learnt and understood text in text and studies uh, of uh, Shastra and criticisms and arguments and what not, the more it helps my own adhyatmic state and uh, my own meditative practice. So the intellectual side helps the meditative side, the embodied inner adhyatmic side and vice versa, the more you can get these experiences, the more the uh, text makes sense to you. So these are two parts. What do you think is the third part? any of you. First part is Adhyatmic practice, second part is text, third part is? Action. Yes, a particular kind of action, debate. I go and I go and uh, uh, encounter my opponents. For 25 years I used to have been going, I started out uh, uh, going to conferences and attack and having a, uh, if they would not put me on the panel, I would sit there and argue. I would read all their dissertations, not somebody over opinionated, having read their stuff, learn in advance who are the speakers and read that stuff and be qualified and good at answer, uh, raising issues. I would read all the dissertations on Hinduism that are being produced in the Western Academy, go to all these religious studies conferences, study who these people are and be, they would not be able to answer 
So they would ignore me or abuse me or keep me out, but I would then start writing blogs. You see, so then, so they didn't know now. Do we ignore him? Do we acknowledge him? So they tried all kind of games. They even tried buying me out. That okay, we make him very important, and then maybe he'll be one of us, and he will not bother. But because of the adhyatmic rootedness and grace of Guru, and my own study of texts, and my un unshakable, uh, you know, idea of my identity, I am not for sale. So it's not they can't hire me, and they can't fire me because there's nothing they can do. So this is a way, I'm a bit of an anomaly because they haven't come across these kind of people before. The people who can for some price or other for sale. I keep uh, making fun of the Indians who are sold out that uh, they at least make sure you sell at a high price. So we don't insult us that we are cheap, you know. If you have to sell out then get some 10,000 crores or whatever, get some big value. So our value is high, you know. So this is our problem where people are for sale at different values. So the three parts are you start with your own inner process. Depending on any sampradaya, any parampara, any siddhant, whatever system you follow, depending on your guru, depending on, people ask me how do I start? I say join an organization. Don't try to do it on your own. Either an individual guru or an organization. So you go to Ramakrishna mission, you go to Chinmaya mission, you go to this one, that one, lot of organizations. Nowadays you are very lucky we have. For people of all kinds, very modern westernized people, all the way to exceedingly traditional people, there are many doorways to enter. Don't say this one is better, whichever one suits you. What is best for you is the one that you are going to follow carefully and closely, not what somebody else followed, maybe the, the different one is good for you. So you must have a process, you must be very loyal to that process. That is the first thing. Secondly, you must do a lot of reading and study and, and, and try to understand these things. Thirdly, you must be practicing this knowledge in open court with no uh, kind of don't be fearful, don't, you know, they will, you will get hit, you will be embarrassed, people will say all kind of things to you and that is what is going to toughen you. You are going to become tough. If you don't have encounters in the Kurukshetra, how are you going to become a Kshatriya? You cannot become a Kshatriya sitting in the VIP stand looking at the battle through television. It's not like that. You have to do it. So that's the, those are the three points I would, uh, I would uh, like to uh, emphasize. So I will give you a quick list of my problems, my needs for intellectual Kshatriyas to help me. So this seminar is not abstract. You, I am asking you to actually come help me. And so I am going to train you with the problem. The problems are, give you some ideas, you give more ideas, you brainstorm. By the end of the day, hopefully we made some teams. Hopefully you are, you are part of some project. You become a Kshatriya by actually jumping in and doing it. No amount of theorizing, you just jump in and do it. So I am going to tell you a lot of things today. Let me give you a few right now. So besides the outsiders who are going to attack me, we also have Hindus who are going to attack me, Indians who are going to attack me. So I am going to tell you a map of the Kurukshetra and I am standing there target of target number one and who are the people pointing at me and this will be a very good way for you to understand the shape of the Kurukshetra and where the need is because I can't be doing it alone. You have to jump in and help me. So outsiders include the people in a particular book that have criticized. So focus on the latest book. Because it has new Purv Pakshins, which means opponents that I am critiquing, new ones than the previous ones, because the issues are different. I am talking about Sanskrit, very deep uh, interpretation of texts, these things I have not done in the past. So this is a very deep book in that sense, foundation. That is why I am so happy and blessed that Sanskrit Bharati is uh, working very closely with me. Sanskrit Bharati is very closely, we are becoming very close as a result of this. And I am so blessed, I feel that we are all in the same boat and this is a good home for me. So the uh, Purva Pakshin in this book are people I call American Orientalists. 
uh, I criticize a man called Sheldon Pollock in the in Columbia University. He is sort of the leader of this group. He is not very well known to traditionalists, but should be well known. I promise you he will become well known. In fact, I told him you will become very famous. And uh, there is no disrespect in my uh, treatment. I treat with my Puru Pakshim with a lot of respect that this is a very serious scholar who is doing his job. But his ideological stand I disagree with, here is why I disagree with. It is not about emotional outburst. And I promise to him that my criticism will be from a intellectual position. I am not rabble rousing. He was very scared that you know they may think he is some Wendy Doniger or somebody like that which he is not by the way. He is very different. And I said I, I am not only going to discuss, not only go, not going to encourage any rabble rousing, I am going to actually distance myself from anybody who does this angry throwing stuff and all that. I want people to learn the intellectual issues. And if you learn the intellectual issues that he is raising in my response, it will raise your understanding and the level from which you will be the Kshatriya will be helpful to our, uh, our community. You will become an important asset, a lead, intellectual leader. We do not have these kind of people enough. We need people like you. And actually it will put the other side more on the defensive. The easy thing for them would be if a bunch of people get emotional, start hitting, shooting, shouting, uh, throwing stones and whatever because then they say here are these rabble rousing radical people, Hindu right, this and that and then they do not have to address the substance of my issue. They get off the hook. They get off the hook and so sad that I had very seriously criticized the whole idea of Freudian psychoanalysis by Wendy Doniger's group, criticized it on the, the, the Indian theory of mind and the Freud theory of mind are such that you cannot apply Freudian psychoanalysis to psychoanalyze Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda and Ganesh and Devi and all of that. You cannot do that. Mine was a very intellectual argument. But hardly be many people understood that. They started throwing rocks and accusing, abusing a Christian missionary. She is not even a Christian, she is a Jew. So it is all kind of mixed up criticism at various levels. Quite, quite foolish criticism also. It gave them a nice way to get off the hook. Because then the fight became between Hindu chauvinists versus leftist scholars. It became a fight of that kind and, and I walked out of it because I just did not want anything to do with this. I do not want the same thing to happen here. So one of the things I am requesting is please understand the issues I am raising in this book. I am very glad you are a large group of people here for the workshop because it shows your commitment and the commitment for so many hours today and then the book, reading of the book later. And then we can have Google Hangouts if you want. I am available for if this group want to have Google Hangout, we, wherever I am in the world, we, I can answer your questions. Somebody has to lead and say, okay, we want a Google Hangout. I will get so many people and let us do it. I will, I will show up. I, I will do that. And I am back here every so often. I will do uh, more advanced development type of courses for you. So you have to be uh, committed to being an intellectual, to be an intellectual Chatriya. And to be an intellectual, you have to first be a reader. And then gradually learn to be a writer. I will teach you that. You know, teach you to uh, respond to the problems that come. Uh, write blogs. Write, uh, first you go to comment boards. Somebody has written something. Maybe you are not ready to write your own blog. But you can post comments. You can post counter arguments. You can come up with something I have written in the book and co quote it. And say this is what it is. And add more of your own. So like that you can build your, your portfolio as an intellectual. But serious intellectual. This way, this way they come down because they realize that I am not alone. There is going to be a whole lot of people and now the time has come that uh, this whole colonial Indology has to face the reality. That is how you bring them down. Otherwise, if it is street fighting and emotions, we are not going to do it. So that is as far as the others are concerned, the outsiders. Now these outsiders also have a lot of Indians in their army. The sepoys. The British sepoys were fighting with guns. And the British did not have Indian intellectuals in their own machinery because it was all for white people. Senior jobs were for white people. Now, senior jobs in the American system, more sophisticated, assimilative, bring people in, even give them high jobs provided they are on their wavelength, correct wavelength for them. So, this system of appropriating uh, intellectual Indians training them, grooming them into their own the western ideology has been going on for the last two generations in a very serious way. Mostly United States, far more sophisticated than the British ever did. And so now a lot of 
made in USA Indian sepoys and American orientalists but with Indian skin Hindu names they are here it is not something will happen it has happened lot of people you know all these Barkha Dutt and uh, uh, who is the one uh, uh, Arnab Goswami and who is the other one yeah somebody gave me a list of these 70% of them got their degrees in Columbia School of Journalism and Vajpayee got in uh, University of Chicago under uh, Sheldon Pollack. So it is very interesting, their journalism schools are training Indian journalists and when you go you are not only learning journalism but you are learning South Asian studies, content, the subject matter and you are learning this caste cows in curry, India and Aryan theory and Rama, Ram is abusive. You are learning all the things that I am reading in this book, exposing. These are things these guys have studied. And then uh, those who are studying Indology, Sanskrit studies, uh, South Asian studies, they are the ones brought here in history departments, political science departments, anthropology de departments, social sciences departments. These social sciences and humanities departments are basically teaching Western Siddhanta. This is very true. The, we, India is the largest consumer of Western Siddhant product. China preaches Chinese Siddhant. Japanese got their own Siddhant. Arabs got their own Siddhant, which is Islam. Persians got their own, their own ideology. They understand others, but uh, enough to do poor paksh about them, but not sold out to them. But in India, to be an elite means you have got your papers published in a Western journal about India. To be an expert on India, you need to say, I got this paper published in this foreign, this, that, that. I got my degree from there. I went to this or that conference overseas. That is how you become an India expert. An Indian becomes an India expert, but he's got the tapa of the West. This is very strange. So, uh, this is the Indian extension of the Western Orientalism army. It's, it's sort of like in the physical army side, British were... British army in India was mainly Indians, you know that. In Jallianwala Bagh, all the General Dyer was sitting in the back, standing in the back giving the command. All the guys with the guns shooting away were Indians, shooting at other Indians. And as I have said a couple of times before, according to some person who did this calculation, he looked at a list of all the wars the British fought during the colonial period. They fought 111 wars, 111 wars using Indian soldiers. The Indians were very proud to join their army under British command. So proud that they have gone out and uh, fired at their fellow Indians and got this medal and that medal. And the Indian Raja would get this gun salute and he would feel very proud. Huh? He would go play polo with these Goras and his son would go to Cambridge and uh, get some nice uh, women there who would be his girlfriends and what not. So they looked after this very well. They were very good at doing this job, the British people. So the 111 wars fought by the British using Indian soldiers compared to that during the brief period when the British were uh, in, in control in China, they could not hire Chinese to raise even one regiment. In India, they could raise armies and armies to fight 111 wars over 200 years and in China, they could not raise one regiment of Chinese because they were not willing to sell out. So they pack their bags, this is not the place to have a colonial empire. They could have colonized China also if they had the same success of recruiting. So why, what is the problem? This is our problem, a very serious inferiority complex. So you see today, the equivalent of this sepoy, the equivalent of these 111 wars is the intellectual battle going on. Whether it is through media, whether it is through NGOs, NGOs is another kind of an army that they have recruited and trained. So, I will tell you, IS officers, I have some of my friends from St. Stephen's College, top guys in industry or in government or foreign service or whatever they are doing, they think I am a weird guy because I am talking like this, none of them believe, none of them are in the same alignment as me. So, I am I'm I'm alone in all kind of circles, including my own friends I grew up with, because they are different. So, uh, I will uh, be, I will continue, I will discuss later on the, the Indian opponents we are going to have, besides the Indian left, the Hindu, the Hindu intellectuals and activists who are going to be upset at me. I want you to know that, 
because this is a special group and we can talk very honestly. Okay. So, I think we should declare a break and uh, we will come back and continue in a few minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>